everyone. Hello. Uh, welcome to the CMS panel. We're going to teach you all about publishing websites with Microsoft Word and Front Page. <laughs> yes. Um, it's not called Front Page anymore. They renamed it oh, no. and jacked the price. Huh. No, they just renamed it and jacked the price. Well, hello, my name is Anthony Klosky. Um, our panelists today include um, David Wheeler, uh, Danielle Nicole, and Cynthia Klosky, my sister. And we'll get into more introductions about them later. Uh, but this is a discussion with the whole room, so I was hoping that about three of you could, uh, I call this like the squeaky wheel portion, where you can kind of tell us your name and something that you're kind of expecting here today, so we can kind of all have an idea of what it is you're looking for. So can we have uh, like three volunteers to say who you are and what you want to know about uh, content management systems? Yes, sir, in the back. <laughs> um, I'm Derek Bashir. I am one of the organizers, but that's not why I care. I work with an open source project called OpenAFS. Um, our website is basically hand-coded in HTML, and it's really, truly awful. Um, among the most likely people who will be uploading content to it, uh, there's a lady who works for IBM Pittsburgh, who in fact is the basically the note taker for our organization, and if it's too complicated, she can't deal with it. So basically, we're looking for a way of getting it so that all the people who are likely to be contributing content to us can do so, and all the people who are likely to be consuming our content will have something that isn't like basically makes them want to stick a fork in their mouth. Okay, next. Anyone looking for anything less specific? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to do with forks and other <laughs> <laughs> Yes, my name's Sean Miller, and I'm just here to be a sponge and absorb everything I can. Excellent. Excellent. One more. Uh, my name is Pam Bresso, and I'm the same. I'm techn technologically um, very slow and want to try to get an, up to speed very quickly, and I think immersing myself in some of these will help for me to pick up things I can go home and Google and, and try to, to learn more about things I don't know. Perfect. Um, Anyone else? We can have one bonus one since the last two were better. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, I'm Jamie, and I would like to learn about different uh, ways that the differences between Drupal and Joomla and WordPress, and and how what maybe one would be better for a certain type of website, while one might be better for another type of website. I think she's a plant. That sounds good. She was the one I had to convince to put this in the schedule. <laughs> it's not true. It's not true. Could we also do maybe a little show of hands as to who's had experience with different content management systems? The ones that we that we know we 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 are talking about people who maybe have expertise in another one. And okay, show of hands. Who is a web developer? Who, who develops themes for websites and mm -hmm. installs websites? Okay, who manages a website without developing how it is built? Okay, and who just uh, blogs and someone else kind of does all of the, uh, you know, like a, an editor of OU or anything like that? More. And are you all on Facebook? Yes. Do you publish notes to Facebook? Show of hands if anyone who publishes. What do you mean, notes? Like, uses Facebook like for making blog posts. No. Okay. Because Facebook is a content management system, I would argue. It's just that you don't get to do so much of the management. Mark Zuckerberg does. Uh, and so, okay, so. So, how many people here use WordPress? And how many people use Joomla? All how many use, well, any, in any form, whether all the things that Anthony was running through, whether use it or create sites with it or something. Um, and uh, SharePoint, any SharePoint people? We got a half of a person. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any educators in the room using Blackboard besides David? That's a whole the website too. Well, okay, so you're a user of, of Blackboard. I, know that I use SharePoint as well because that's what they have in the wild. And how about Drupal people? 
couple of half of a half of a quarter of a Joomla. Uh, I'm a designer, but I dabble in the web development, so I've experimented with Joomla and Drupal, but I haven't actually had to find my development sites. Okay, cool. Does anyone build their own content management system? Ah. 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 Yes. I do, but it's printed page, so does that count? Okay. <laughs> and then, uh, how about other ones that we like? Um, what was the one that we were trying to get the guy to come in? Expression engine. Expression engine, folks. Uh, I've used it. It sucks. Okay. I've used it. <laughs> Squarespace. Anyone know Squarespace? Squarespace isn't bad. If you want to, I think I came with my GeoCities. Geo Anyone using GeoCities? Yeah. Is that still open? How about they close that? <laughs> <laughs> I sort of am using them. Just like straight uh, uh, HTML, CMS. Got a couple of that. Thank you. Okay, cool. Well, so we um, we will uh, after we do some introductions, we'll kind of get into what we mean by content management system because I think maybe not everyone uh, has raised their hand at all. So uh, maybe we can talk about what it is to be a content management system. So let's begin. Who wants to begin? I want to know what you do for a profession panelist and uh, what websites you're using and what they're running. Can I feel like close my mind? <laughs> Danielle, knows. Danielle chose to go first. <laughs> um, my name is Danielle Nichol, and I'm here. My, my blog is not on my name tag anymore. It's um, one damn thing. It's on WordPress. But in my other life, I work for um, a large law firm, and our content management system is built for Microsoft SharePoint. We uh, run two instances of SharePoint. We run 2003 to run our extranets, which is mostly for our client management. And uh, we're actually in the process of moving that to 2007. But our intranet is run completely on, on MS 2007. Um, I mean, SharePoint's part of the Office suite now, but in, in many aspects, but we do have to buy separate licenses for it. And um, there's also different business packages and such that you can buy for um, SharePoint. So I think. It's the corporate standard for a lot of large institutions, mainly because many companies already use Microsoft Office products, like Excel and Word and PowerPoint. And SharePoint seems to work, you know, very well with those products, and also because it is very costly. Uh, depending on the size of your organization, it can be tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars to implement. But it does seem to kind of be the industry standard for that type of content management. Um, uh, if you're not familiar, we can get more into yeah. why. Like, More, oh, sorry, we're still doing an Yeah, I was on a little there. But yeah. So I use SharePoint in my uh, private life, and I'm sorry, I use a WordPress in private life on SharePoint. Excellent, thank yeah. you. Greg. So I'm David Wheeler. I'm a professor of psychology at Robert Morris University, and also a massage therapist. I've uh, got maybe 10 websites that I work with, use my, for myself personally. Which is one of the advantages of Drupal, so you can do all that really pretty easily. Um, so I use I'm a Drupal user. I started using it about two years ago, and I'm also the maintainer of the Drupal users group in the local area. And one of the ways that I chose Drupal was through this website here, cmsmatrix.org. So those of you who are wanting to know about every possible CMS system out there, yeah. you can go and sort of various uh, characteristics and you know, filter it for various things that you wanted. And I sort of picked Google based on, on this thing here, just saying it's like you can do everything. Okay, thank you. Cindy. <clears throat> so I'm Cindy Kluski. I'm the president of Big Big Design, and they point out I'm his big sister as well. I, um, at Big Big Design, we but mostly use WordPress as a, a simple sort of content management system for some small businesses and individuals, as well as using it as a blogging system. So we do an awful lot in WordPress. Someone, uh, if a client needs a site that has more user interaction, like community building kind of things, then we use Joomla. We use it kind of a lot. Um, we did, um, the pre a previous, the current version of the PodCamp Pittsburgh site is on, uh, the current one's on WordPress. Previously we had it on Joomla. It turned out that more of the PodCamp organization kind of really understood WordPress, so it turned out to be a better thing, so we switched over to it for that. I do have one Drupal site that I manage. It's a very old Drupal site for Pittsburgh bloggers. And uh, I've been talking, uh, in the past, uh, I've been telling David we really need to upgrade it or somehow it needs help because poor Pittsburgh bloggers is, um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with it. It's a site uh, aggregator. It aggregates 
feet of all the Pittsburgh blocks that they use in this one. It is so broken and, and hurt and wounded, the poor <laughs> limping thing every day. So um, so I do have a little bit of Drupal experience, but. Um, you have one Drupal site working, the Butler blogger. Oh, yeah, that one's working well because there aren't actually blocks in Butler. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What's the name of the one in Pittsburgh? pghbloggers.org. Oh, and that's in Joomla? That's a Drupal site. Okay, so what, uh, are you done, Cynthia? Yes. Thank you. And um, let's talk about what we mean by content management system. I kind of you know, said that I think of Facebook as a content management system. It's just that you don't get to manage it so much. Um, but let's talk about what what is content that makes up a website. Is everyone here familiar with uh, when I say source code, that, that there is, you know, you have a browser and it renders uh, a bunch of code that makes up a web page. It renders it one way for when you're browsing it, but there's other information that you can't see. So it makes up a copy of a website. Um, and what else What else do we call them that makes up a website? Well, there's the, the access and the permissions and security of it. Well, I just the content, not the main. Okay, so you're saying that, that the... Uh, access and permissions is part of the the content management part of the content. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, so it, there's also um, information that helps you find things, uh, uh, find photographs, find pages, do searches on your website. Those are all tools. I mean, so the content management system, I think, includes a set of content that is typically stored in a database of some sort, and um, uh, the appearance, the layout of the content on different pages, and there may be six different sets of layouts, and then the access to um, both control the content and to um, to control the content and to um, do different things, use different access parts of the site. And different content management systems typically include ways to add different features and widgets and other kind of things that are not strictly content, maybe they're access to other things and tools or ads and you can also you through uh, if, if your uh, content management system allows you it tells you how all this content displays you can, uh, mm -hmm. you know, have headings be bigger than you know paragraphs and then so is it, are, is all that true for SharePoint yeah, but I mean, there's a lot of the back end data management, um, and then it's pretty much there's a front end display as well, too. And the, the front end display is all done through web parts that can be customizable and queryable, so you can kind of pull your data as you want to and have display as you need to. And the templates are also fully customizable, you can plug in there. And at your law firm, who was populating the database that you're pulling from? Well, we're a pretty large organization, so there's a whole database group that maintains the database, and we're able to pull that information into SharePoint. Um, uh, same thing with like our financial information, uh, and the accounting information, and also the human resources information is all pulled in through people's help. So there's you know the capacity to um, kind of build in your existing data systems and display. And, and so they're using Microsoft Office products to make this financial. Some of them are, some of them are not. Some of them are homegrown products. And okay. some of them are specific to the legal industry. So that is some, you know, content uh, as part of the uh, content management system manages that you might not think of when you compare it to, say, Joomla and WordPress. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and David, you are a professor, so you manage content, which is your courses, right? Well, I. I do a little bit of, you know, you're talking about Blackboard there. Yeah. yeah. And I just hate Blackboard, so I don't really want to talk about it. Uh, and, you know, it just requires way too much, or actually, the reason I like using computers is so that you don't have to do a lot of work. But with Blackboard, you pretty much have to rewrite your course every semester, even though they're saying it's like important, but really it requires rewriting it. Um, but with Drupal, it's, um, you know, the three parts, but one is a core. Then there's contributed modules, which are the things that can like do anything. Um, and then there's the third part, which is the theming system, which is sort of like a template in other systems. So the modules and the core part access the database and they uh, manipulate the data. But then the theme is what makes actually generates the output HTML uh, that ends up showing up on the website. And uh... 
So that, I think, is a pretty good kind of view of the broad scope that a uh, content management system could be. It's all of these different ways you can take all this content and uh, and make it, you know, put it together as a website and publish it. Um, so uh, we talked we talked about, okay, so let's um, open source. Cindy, why would you recommend someone use an open source content management system? What is the benefit of using? I think the, the question between, so what open source means is that the, the code for something, what, um, the code for the software, for example, for the website, is um, available, the code itself is available for anyone to see and manipulate and, and add to, um, as opposed to, um, what is the other word I want to use? It's a little too early in the morning. Proprietary. Proprietary system where some company, like, for example, Microsoft, owns the code and lets you have a um, uh, compiled sort of instance of it to run somewhere. Um, so I think I guess SharePoint is a is a proprietary closed kind of system, and WordPress, Drupal, Joomla are open source. The advantage of an open source system is that all people in the world who want to, and hopefully some of them are smart enough to do it, can access the code and extend and test and explore it, and make sure it's solid or um, uh, and so forth. The weakness of it is that a lot of these people being volunteers um, and not all working in concert with each other um, mean that you have um, pieces of code that are of questionable uh, worth. So for example, in Joomla, part of why I like Joomla um, and WordPress both is that you can, you've got the core system and then you've got modules and things that you add in, extensions. Joomla, they, they call them components if they're really big and then modules work with components and they're sort of smaller and tend to be a little tiny box of content or something and then plugins which move the wall through. Um, uh, all those things, um, you know, you, let's say I want a feature to show photos, like a photo gallery or something on Joomla. Then I have to look at all the available free and paid photo gallery components that have been built by people. And it, it takes me a while to find a really good one. When I find a really good one, then I can use it on a bunch of different websites. Um, the, but if that, like for example, um, not everyone thinks that it's really important to build a website that works on Internet Explorer. Some people are just tired of it because it's, as, as many of you know, probably the um, not the friendliest browser for you know, complying with, um, with the other browser. With like every other browser in the world. So some people just don't bother to make their component work with that. And you might not know it until you've already tried to install a component and add it in. <clears throat> and wasted a lot of time making it work with the company. So oh, a good reason why you want a proprietary one is if you paid for something, then that company is going to support it, and if they don't, you know, if there's a bug or a problem or something, then you have a very clear person to go and say, hey, fix your software that I purchased from you. Well, Cindy just jumped on my question for you, Danielle, of yes. why would you want a proprietary system? Do you have plugins in your proprietary system? Um, no, but there actually are, um, there are, there are definitely development areas for SharePoint I, for independent developers building um, web parts. So you can go in and if you're looking for a web part that um, displays certain type of information or helps you organize information, like I was just looking at one on this um, site, SharePoint user, I think it's called SharePointEndUser.com, and it was like an easy way to do um, a tab interface um, for uh, multiple list web parts that you might have on your site. But you can actually go out and you can search web parts <coughs> and um, upload it into your system, but then again, you're dealing with I guess it's the code, the, the basic code is still proprietary. Yeah, but the API. Oh, API. Yeah, thank you. So they can build on this very similar of that, um, which is nice because <laughs> otherwise you are, you know, we have a limited number of development resources internally, so we have to figure out all, how to build all those web parts on our own. It, it's very time consuming. So there is a little bit of uh, customization that you can get externally, but, you know, internally, I think what's nice about SharePoint is that. It's a familiar product because it works a lot like other MS products, um, like Office products. Um, so if you're familiar with those interfaces, and I think it's simple to learn how to use SharePoint. Um, I mean, I think it, I mean, because I'm coming from this not as a technology person, but as a business person and a content, a person who managed content before. So for me, like, the SharePoint tool was really uh, pretty easy for me to adopt because it seemed to work similarly to other products. Now, David, you do not uh, develop for you in your, your your Drupal group is not a group of developers, but Drupal users. Is that right? Well, it's a group of individuals here. 
And one of the amazing things is that there actually are a few developers in it who have contributed some major parts to it. Can you guys share like what kind of gadgets you can add to your Drupal websites and, and kind of you know uh, share product reviews? Yeah, it's like have the, the website up here. Again, the purpose of our Drupal is to just support the, the, the development and implementation of uh, Drupal here in Western, southwestern Pennsylvania. So we're really a support group more than anything. And when we get together about once a month, we kind of like presentations, but then you know, people can just bring up issues, mention like your favorite module, here's something I, I really like using. And so you learn from other people that way. At this last meeting, we did pretty much just work through for two hours, work through a couple of the users and just sort of show them how to set up a website in there. So that's really pretty variable what we do. But it is more on the user support side rather than you know, supporting developers, people who are developers, they're interacting with other developers around the world. And, and Drupal just launched a, uh, a new blog software, is that right? That's easier to kind of get running than the... I have no idea. <laughs> the problem with Drupal right now <clears throat> is that we're four days away from a new version. So it's, it's highly in flux right now, so I actually recommend that people don't try it until October 16th, <laughs> because every minute there's going to be a change pretty much in the system. And if you go to my website, davidwheelerphd.com, you'll find it's broken, I'm sure, because that's my Drupal 7 website, uh, and that's, you know, I'm sort of testing things out on there. So I don't really know what's going to happen to the, the uh, blog API. It's changed. We've got this change in the last week, and I haven't had really had a, a chance to find out what's happening with it. I just want to comment about the Drupal thing. Um, you're not going to be using Drupal 7 anytime soon. I still can't use Drupal 6 because they don't have all the modules that I need to do my podcast available on Drupal 6, so I'm stuck on Drupal 5 at the time. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people won't be using 7 unless you're using just the base functionality. Right? Yeah, that's a really good point for all of these things that you have to make sure that all your components are able to upgrade. Um, when you want to upgrade to the core system. And that's an issue because sometimes the reason why there's an upgrade is because there was a security issue of some sort. Um, again, the open source piece means that everybody can also take a look and find the holes in the software, right? Um, so, so that's an important and interesting point. Danielle, you go on to a uh, SharePoint users group locally. I do. I don't probably take advantage of it as much as I do, but I think I'm looking for other um, end users in the area that. So there's also developer groups in Pittsburgh. So there's developer groups, even though it's a proprietary system. What are they developing? Um, usually they're developing custom web parts to get data in from data to display correctly on SharePoint. I know that I mean, a couple of large projects that we're working on are um, client team sites that use, um, we're trying to capture the, all of the client information that's brought in from the different departments like financial information and other information trying to to display in a way that kind of looks like a uh, well, like just like a summarized sheet of information of what's going on with a particular client at any time. There's just so much information and it's difficult to um, you know get it to display in one in one place. It makes sense for it. And then use it so. What did you have to do to learn how to use ship? Me personally not much. <laughs> I started up uh, the, the majority of the sites that we use are, are really basic uh, collaboration sites where um, you know we have a set template and then there's a document library um, um, which functions almost like a shared drive that you can kind of upload documents um, and uh, give permissions to certain people to see that information. There will be like list link or a link list or something like that which might be links out to other sites within um, our intranet to other department information or particular forms or things that they might need access to, where there might be RSS feeds to external um, information, um, uh, the pr particularly um, professional um, journals and, and things like that, we might have RSS feeds, RSS feeds in there as well. Um, tons of contact information, like we're a large organization with over 5,000 employees, um, so it's kind of important to keep that in one place. Um, and then just general information about the, the company is the majority of the stuff that we maintain on the site. Cindy, you mentioned that uh, the reason uh, Big Big Design goes between Joomla or WordPress for a client is, is usually how how many users are updating it and who's permitted to see content, whatever. Tell us more about the permissions and users 
of the website. So Word, WordPress has, um, uh, I think, a, like four different levels of, of user access, and they tend to be focused on who's no, able to. I'm starting with Word oh, WordPress. And then I was going oh, WordPress has four. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, but and you can tell from my Anthony's surprise that we don't tend to use all of those different models very much. What they tend to do is control who can make changes to the site. So you've got the you've got the um, you're a member level. I don't know if it's called member. It might be something else. Then you've got um, author, editor, administrator, and so along those lines. So each level can um, do things to people and content created by people at a lower level. So there's not a lot of granularity there. Um, the other piece about it that is sort of awkward is, is that they don't have a lot of control permissions between who can built in, I mean, in the default system. Um, you know, once you're an author, you can control just your own pages. If you're one level up, then you're allowed to control everybody below you. So there's not a lot of like refinement. If you had different departments in an organization, for example, and you wanted them each to be only able to do their own stuff, then um, the default system doesn't do that. You have to get component that does. Joomla has a little more granularity and it has two, like the, whether you can access the back end of the site or you can only see the front end of the site. And so um, that's good because then the administrator, people who you'd like to think of as sort of the site administrators, you can give them a higher level. Um, but again, there's not a lot of granularity. So once you're able to edit um, any one page, this is again the default system. Um, once you're able to edit uh, you know, one page of the site, um, or control other people below you, then you've got everybody below you. So now they're, because people um, do want something more sophisticated, there are actually a, a number of different components and, and systems that are at, that are add-ons to, extensions to Joomla that you can use to get that greater granularity. They are hard to work. So when you want to do one, um, for example, if you're budgeting time for a project or something, you really have to count for a whole lot of time to make that hard work. It's, it's going to be a big um, hassle. But once it works, it works. It's great. Um, the, other, the other piece of that, shoot, there was one more piece. Community Builder. Yeah, Community Builder is, is an example of it. Okay, so there's the accessing and the editing of it and so forth. But then also there's components that can make, you can build a site that is almost like your own personal private Facebook. So Community Builder is one. These are, these are components that are add-ons to Joomla. Um, and then you've got people able to friend each other and only see each other's friends, you know, content and look at connections and so forth and get very Facebooky or MySpacey. Uh, so that's so that's a, that. But again, that's not the default Joomla. That's an add-on. Community Builder is one of the most established. There's like a whole user group of people within the larger Joomla user group, user world. There's like this Community Builder user world. And, um, so. Um, that's kind of interesting as well. The whole community has, has evolved around the need to have community within uh, one website. And so you're able to build websites, and you know, where clients can you know see stuff within their account. And well, this particular client sites are internal only. They're for they're for like the marketing, accounting, and other departments that touch that client to be able to go in and look at the information of the clients. But we also offer extranet services um, where there is a separate login for external. Um, visitors and we um, a lot of times our our folks use that to um, create a shared space where they can upload um, case information or whatever uh, to share with that particular client to prepare for a, a case um, and that's a real simple I mean that's basically a document library and a link list and contact information but um, I think the, we were talking a lot about permissions and I think that one thing that SharePoint does really well is permissions and uh, we use permissions more I guess less, I mean, we do use it for sharing, but a lot of it is for limiting <laughs> what people uh, see, what they can see, and what they can't see. Um, SharePoint does um, groups with um, Active Directory, so if you have existing Active Directory sites um, or, or, or groups available, you can um, use them in SharePoint. You can also create your own SharePoint groups, um, so you can either target information specifically to that group or um, um, kind of push it to that group using audiences or um, user classes. So. Um, I do think that is one nice thing that um, SharePoint does well is uh, the permissions in the group, the grouping. Active Directory is a part of Microsoft's um, uh, Windows server. Yep. So, and it's nice too because then you don't actually have to update your groups within SharePoint if they're updated through Active Directory, they'll update automatically through SharePoint. So, that's the way we like to do it the best, otherwise, you're doing a lot of um, 
a lot of user maintenance. What would you say is the minimum number of users and um, user levels to be worth building, you know, for it to be worth doing a SharePoint project? Yeah, I was trying to figure that out. I, like, I had on Google, it's SharePoint for my small business, and all I found were like a couple of uh, um, forum questions with no answers to them, and, uh, and a couple of things to it. So I would imagine that you're talking you're probably talking a large, medium-sized company, or we're talking enterprise-sized companies. You've got to at least have a Windows server, I think. Yeah. So that's going to be you're having some sort of yeah. internal company network that's got, let's say, ten or more. Yes. Yeah. And the Windows server itself, I think. Yeah. I mean, I really, I think it can be very cost-prohibitive depending on your organization. Um, I've seen companies. I mean, as far as the physical company size, I really don't think that's what limits you know whether you're going to SharePoint or not. I think some clients that might be using the content manager system. So I've seen like I have clients that use. Um, SharePoint, they might only have 25 people employed, but there's like 10 out of those 25 are updating and taking care of SharePoint stuff. There's like 300 or 400 customers they may have. Oh, okay. I think once you reach like above 100, I think 100 overall users, whether or not they're inside the company or outside the company, once you reach that mark, I think that's kind of what pushes you to like. Yeah, that would, you say, would you say like 100 is like the, the ceiling for a Joomla community, or you get thousands? Oh, no, there's people that have like a thousand or something. Yeah. Um, one of the sites that we did um, is iQuixi, um, which is having a session right now at PodCamp, elsewhere here, <laughs> somewhere. It's a, um, it's like a Facebook um, um, for tween girls, girls ages uh, 8 to 13. And um, part of what we wanted to do there is a lot of issues about, you know, regulatory compliance for all the safety for the girls. So what we're adding on and, and are different pieces to, to kind of control access. But we're counting on it being you know, we built it in Joomla as basically sort of a, a way to kind of get a site up and running and kind of test out what are the girls going to want to do. We don't have to really kind of know all the things they want to do. So we wanted to build the site quickly, below relatively low cost, and then over time, as we figure out what parts need to be kind of customized and optimized, then they'll be able to um, bring in a development team and build a whole custom system, you know, from the ground up, but using, using the existing site almost as a live spec, if you will. And, and what would you say is the maximum number of users for a, a, a cleanly functioning WordPress site for like a member? member you know, there's, a, there's a website here in Pittsburgh called Pittsburgh Designers that is using that is using WordPress um, and, and everyone who wants to can join and become like a contributor or something and that gives you basically the ability to update your profile so you're adding yourself to a directory. They've got you know a lot of users, hundreds and hundreds of users, but you're not editing content. You're not really adding a lot of content. So it depends not only on the number of users, but also on how much each of those users needs to be able to do. So it's a hard question to answer. Okay. Yeah, I'm talking about Drupal here. Yeah. <laughs> so first off, with the permissions, I mean this is one of the real powerful things about Drupal is that you can have like infinite number of roles, infinite number of positions or of, of permissions. So um, you can get down to the like word level. If you want to have each word accessible by different roles, you could do that. Uh, it's possible to have it again set up so that each user has a different set of permissions. Uh, so it's again really, really easy to have really, really fine grain control in Drupal. And the other thing is scalability. I mean, you can have millions of people on a Drupal website. It just requires a little bit of knowing how to set up your servers. If you've got that much into the servers, it's really limiting um, how you do it. But things like the Economist on Drupal. Um, so it's again really, really large websites. I think MTV was, I'm not actually positive about that. So again, there's, you can just have millions of users if you want to. And again, you have to do some optimization to do that. Now, I don't know so much about Drupal. What's the cost for some sort of the bonus? Zero. 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 Okay. Well, I just think open source charge. Joomla has Joomla art, and they charge you for that. Yeah. That's a, it's like it's not, what you're buying there is you're paying a group of people who are Joomla experts to figure your tech support. I know if it was the same thing. Like, does there Joomla is, have stuff like that? Yeah, well? the person who invented Joomla is uh, Luis Boitart, and he um, started in the year 2000. Last year, he started a company called Acquia. So they will take on you know setting up your own, you know, do the hosting. Do your own, do the development for you, and so forth. So there are some firms out there that do that. There's actually one of the reasons to uh, to learn Drupal is if you want to get employed, because there's lots of people looking for freelancers who do Drupal, especially the theming part. Theming isn't that easy, so people are, you know, if you can get into the theming, lots of people want that. Yeah. 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 Y
A new thing in WordPress is the premium themes that uh, you, pay, you pay for a theme, and it allows you a little more content management uh, where you can manipulate your menus a little uh, a little more easily. Yeah, some of the, um, some, there, there have always been themes that you could purchase for WordPress and so forth, but lately, the theme developers, some of them have become more sophisticated, and again, they've kind of created their own sort of subgroups within the larger thing. That, that's also true of Joomla. And I imagine this is true of, of right. Drupal as well. So what's kind of neat, though, is then you you don't just buy a theme that gives you a look, but also on the back end you get different controls. So one of the themes that's really popular right now is called Thesis for WordPress. Um, uh, people like Chris Brogan use it. We've, we've been experimenting with. I'm using it on my private blog, which is kind of funny for a web developer to buy a theme from somebody else. But um, <laughs> but it means that I have more time and to focus on the content, which is really what hopefully people would come to this idea. We use the yeah, something like a dopa or something. I can't think what it's called. What's it called? Like A T H U A L P A or something. Like and then there's another one. Yeah, there's a couple of them, and they're and they're good this way. Also, there's all kinds of information on how to use thesis out there, where there isn't with other themes. What's true? What is the the end user? the ideal and art, ideal and artists and entertainers, and, and a lot of them are not tech people. They just want to be able to go in and, and use. What does each of these systems show to them? What does the end site look when they go to the site to add content or what? Well, there's a couple things there because in most of these, um, and I'm pretty sure this is true of, of, of Drupal, I'm not sure about SharePoint, there are client tools that you can use. For example, when I blog, I typically blog using a, a Firefox extension called um, Scribefire. So I'm, I'm actually not always looking at the WordPress backend. I'm just I'm, I'm like looking at a web page. Oh, hold on. Um, here, uh, you see this is a little tiny editor, right? And you can see there here on the side. These are my these are blogs that I edit. This one here, the um, outside perspective, is actually a type pad blog that um, the uh, Pittsburgh Symphony uses for their for their bloggers, right? So it just, uh, oh, and you can see the post that I wrote there. <laughs> um, so, um, so, the, so if I, for, for, you've actually, the question you're asking there is when the, when the user of the site um, has to edit stuff, uh, how, which is the simplest one to use. That right. is exactly why we ended up a couple years ago um, taking Joomla as our um, content management system rather than Drupal because, and, and now Drupal's gone through several revisions since then, and I understand it's happy to handle it. It's much, much better. At that time, several years ago, I felt like I was not going to be able to train any of my clients to use Drupal. That, that's part of it, but the other part is what do their clients see when they come to the site? Well, in each case, they'll see the, the, I mean, the site can be made as beautiful as you want, no matter which of these systems you're using, I think. So from the, from the consumer, sort of, of the, the visitor of the site perspective, it doesn't really matter, necessarily. Um, and so the challenge, I think, is how hard is it to run from the administrator or, or the contributor side? I don't know, what do you guys think about that? Well, we pretty much limit the, the uh, end user's role when it's to the content management part. So they're uploading files, they're maintaining their files. Um, they're maintaining contact information, they're maintaining announcements and that sort of information, but the, the sites and everything, we, and all the permissions we actually create on the back end for them. To give the level of permission that you need to, to do design, sometimes there's things then that they can do that would mess up the master template that we don't necessarily want to make, and it's just all about consistency when you're in a corporate environment, right? Um, and then also, too, with permissions, if you give them the level of permission to change other people's permissions on their site, and they can change permissions on other sites as well, too. So we do keep a lot of the, that kind of like um, upper echelon stuff locked down to um, um, the uh, internet team. But then when the end user uses it, it looks just like a website. Um, the back end part is um, kind of, you know, it just looks like a little uh, like a little web page that says here you want to update this document library and they click on it and it just looks like what a, a shared folder in Microsoft Word would look so they can actually click and drag um, folders and documents from someplace on their computer and all of a sudden it's shareable to all the people that were in their group. Um, I think that ease of use really appeals to um, 
the end user. That it's not that much different than the products that they're currently using. And then you get this great, you know, front end user interface where it's like an internal website and all the information is there and they can share it with the other users. Just sort of in the line with that, uh, we've posted about 150, 175 websites and about a couple dozen of them we have used to get the real simple sites, Lucid CMS, which uh, unfortunately is not being actively maintained, but it's still so functional uh, that I get people, all they, if they just know how to put a paragraph tag and bold and, and uh, italic tags and stuff, which is very simple to pick up in 10 minutes, then it's real easy interface to go in and it's much simpler as far as template. You get templates off of open source templates. Uh, there's a couple of uh, really good sites and you can import them very easily. Uh, you can do CSS very easily with it. And I had looked at Drupal, I looked at Joomla, I had looked at Zara, I had looked at where every one of them and, and just happened to find a mention of this in some obscure things that well, why don't you do your templating the way Lucid does it because it's so, so simple and within two hours at the Pittsburgh Freenet site using it. So um, there are some options there for very simple sites without having to get into some of the more full-blown things. Uh, it still has a lot of the capabilities. But. I was going to say, I do think it is kind of hard to, to um, predict what's going to be simple for an end user to use, though, because there are so many different levels of um, knowledge and things that maybe like seem simple initially. Like when I was first getting my first WordPress site, I just thought it was really difficult to get into, but then it became easier. There's, Sorry, a, there's a website called Open Source CMS where you can actually run demos of the different CMS and see what they would want to try them out. Yeah, so uh, everyone hear that? Open Source CMS .com. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's you demo. Open source. Every, every open source. Yeah, it's got a bunch of different. There's another one too. I can't think of what it's called. But yeah, there's a couple, two or three different ones. Yeah, that's the one I can think of. Also, for ease of use, I mean, uh, I think pretty much every system allows you to tie in with Flickr if you want to like upload galleries and stuff, which is often a difficult kind of content to manage on any site. Um, but people find uploading files to Flickr to be pretty easy because that's what Flickr has done, and it hosts it off of your site. That um, you know, if, if ease of use, I don't know what kind of artists these are, but they're photographers or painters and stuff, and they have mostly they're entertainers. Okay, I, I have one that um, if she can't pick it up and in five seconds understand it, she's on to something else. The other person we were going to have here uh, was going to represent Ning, which uh, you know is not an open source, like not a build web pages thing, but is a whole box of community tools that very easily let you, um, you know, do like the social network um, tools to, to have events and information about people. And I find is pretty self-explanatory because the editor and stuff shows up on every page. You know, when you want to edit a page, it doesn't. To, I think that that's confusing when someone says edit this page, they get confused if they get taken somewhere else that looks like, you know, an email editor. Um, but if that's on every page, it seems clearer to people that you just... The, the uh, one caution I would offer to people who are looking at being as a possibility is that, um, and they may have changed this recently, but in the, in the past, it's been very difficult to move your content management or your, your membership and everybody to another site. I think it's really important that you don't get yourself, your, your system, your community locked uh, up. And one of the things I kind of like is that you can, people have come up with ways to move stuff from Joomla to WordPress, WordPress to Joomla, Drupal to this, and you can get your, your stuff out of there if you needed to. But Ning, because it is, uh, you know, there's a company, Ning, that, that does all this, they, for whatever reason, have not made it easy so far to re, to take your site out of there and put it in a different system. So it's a caution. Promo name of the site because I just typed in name.com and it said, Welcome back, Daniel. Oh my god, yes, it is. So apparently they use uh, that open ID, yeah, the national blog posting month. Um, uh, another uh, Drupal site actually, I believe that uh, National Novel Writing Month is a Drupal, Drupal site, and they have a really nice forum. And, and something else, as far as ease of use goes, if you're used to something like WordPress.com, uh, 
in the spring is going to be drupalgardens.com, and that's on the, the handout here also. It's going to be the same type of thing to Drupal, where they'll be maintaining all the, the funny stuff in Drupal behind the scenes, and it's more just so, so people can go in there and easily set up things. So in, in WordPress, there's WordPress.org, which is where you download the open source software, and you have to keep you know keep downloading it to to update uh, your software so you get the latest version, uh, which you know helps protect your stuff. WordPress.com, you know, would be like your website. WordPress.com will be like your address, but uh, WordPress is maintaining the software, keeping it up to date, and so. So Drupal Gardens is going to be this thing where it's host, you know, Drupal's hosting it, and they, every time there's a new uh, update to the software, they do it. The problem with it, um, like we talked about in the search engine plugins uh, for WordPress, is that, um, you know, well, the the search engine stuff does not show up on your domain name. Uh, you, you kind of have to, you can pay a premium to get uh, special plugins on your WordPress.com site. Um, but those plugins are very important uh, for um, doing a lot of things that are important for hacking. I mean, a lot of the reason you want to have a website sometimes is to be found in search engine stuff. And, and to do all of that properly, you kind of want your own thing. But if you just want to get a website out there, get publishing, and it's also, like Cindy said, WordPress.com is a great place to start a website if you don't want to take the time to build the final um, system. Uh, you just want to start writing. You can export from it very easily and then import it into another, another work, your own WordPress.org site or uh, move it over to Joomla or to Joomla. Speaking of plugins, how do they compare between the three systems? Well, I mean, Drupal has all these modules, they don't kind of call plugins, really. Um, and they're really a way to make it so that the core system doesn't get hacked. It doesn't get changed. It's like everything there stays set the same, and then you can like, modify any functionality in core with these additional plugins. There are about 4,000, uh, or a little bit more than 4,000 plugins available. And one of the things you have to worry about is finding ones that are currently being maintained. So a lot of times people do some little module for their own website, and then they contribute it, and then they never touch the tech. And there's usually two or three modules that will do the same function. So again, you gotta find out what they're things that people are actually using and so forth. And there are, there are sites available for that too. In Joomla, um, in addition to, you can have extensions, which is like uh, Cindy uh, talked about Community Builder, which allowed the social networking thing. So it was a big, big gigantic tool that you had, or a whole package of tools. There's also the plugin uh, widgets, you know, or WordPress widget like modules. And the way the Joomla themes work is that you, you tell it, um, so we have so many positions on the page, something like a couple different positions in the header, we have the left sidebar, the right sidebar, the main content, stuff in the footer. And in you can see your list of modules and tell it what position to be in and what order they're in. So it allows a little more shuffling around than WordPress, which has the, you know, you can have a number of sidebars, but um, that you drag the theme has to, you think so. In both of those cases, your theme, the quality of your theme is going to control how much moving around you can do. I would say that the WordPress code seems to be a little simpler, and so because a lot of these people that are building the modules and so forth are, um, you know, of varying skill levels, there's a there's a lot of WordPress um, plugins with a lot of um, variation in quality, uh, and, and the, I think the thing is. Same is probably true of all of them. What you want to do when you're looking at a module is, uh, of any, uh, or addition on any of these systems, is take a look at the forum and the, and the support for the one that you're plugging in and, and see you know, what kind of complaints, whether issues get addressed quickly, whether there's a, a support um, level you can purchase. I used to so still the stars. Well, yeah, start from the start. Do you, do you trust those? Do they, is, does any of them have a, a more reliable forum? Like as far as rating plugins, or uh, you know, do they all get? Do people game the system in rating plugins and any of these? There's really no gaming in Drupal. If they're like listed just by how many websites are using them. Oh, so that's a useful thing. Yeah. Right? Drupal doesn't have to do that currently. Their way of searching for a, um, a, an extension has improved recently. It, it, the, the core group put some time into building the thing. It's hard to find a really good plugin on WordPress just because there's no 
the system for searching for them is pretty lame. You're almost better off looking at doing a Google search to figure it out. And, and I don't know about, I mean, for SharePoint, there, I don't think there's any rating system for the different type of web parts that you can download. But the nice thing about SharePoint is there is a dev or sandbox environment, so it's going to rate your site. We'll know any dev environment before we launch the podcast. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm, uh, so um, I'm sorry if you have additional. Oh, do we have one last question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, if, if, if they're quick, we'll, okay. Can we quickly? Okay. Big changes in Drupal 7 from the point of view of uh, users and administrators. Okay. Uh, huge push on the user experience in Drupal 7, so it's going to be a big change. Um, everything, there's going to be a lot more things in core, so managing, managing files, managing images. Um, those things are going to be in core. Everything's a field now instead of a node, so it's going to be a lot more granular control. So it's just it's a lot better experience. There's been a lot of focus on that. Drupal 8 is going to have more designers involved. It's going to be really much more focused on the actual design and even better. So that's going to be something here too. The final question. Can you comment on the uh, constraints of Drupal 8 and organizing large quantities of information? I mean, in content, content management, we talk about format and plugins and functionality, but one of the real issues is seems to be managing large quantities of information. You know, over 500 pages or 1,000 pages. How do you, how do the contributors, what tools exist to help the contributors keep the content organized yeah. and permit users to search effectively? Kind of find the right stuff. Drupal set up to scale rather yeah. organically. You can set up your own levels of categories, and, uh, and it doesn't matter if it's you know, four pages or like 40,000. And, and Jim works pretty good. At, Joomla has just two levels of, of categorization with sections and categories. You can, get it, you can add in some extensions that'll give you more granularity than that. Uh, it works well for, let's say, a new site or something where the content's changing an awful lot. It's a, a little bit more challenging if you've got um, sort of a more static site with a lot of information in it. Um, so if you, then you might want to link or something. Yeah, so it's not awesome at it, but it's also not that bad. Um, we've, we've built some pretty big sites, and uh, this gentleman here in 83, we're working on a site with this company right now, and it's going to be a very large site, but I think it's going to be pretty useful too. And, and SharePoint is just a piece that's built on the web. It's expensive, it takes a lot of time. SharePoint is specifically for being an editor. Yeah. All yeah. the content that you're big publishing and other things pop. All right, thank you everyone. Sorry for that. Thank you.